10, David Adam Pate. In 2015, David Adam Pate, a 25-year-old white supremacist from Lancaster, North Carolina, was sent away to life in prison for the gruesome stabbing and murder of Ricky James, a 33-year-old black man. The crime happened in November 2013, when Pate lured James into the woods with promises of wine, before stabbing him a total of 39 times. During his arrest and lengthy police interviews, Pate showed no remorse for his actions. He claimed that he wanted to decapitate James and seemed proud that he used a butcher's knife, similar to the one shown in the movie Halloween. But shockingly, Pate actually blamed the victim for his own death, saying it was James's fault for deciding to go into the woods with someone who looked nothing like him. After investigating Pate's home, police officers found a concerning collection of at least 20 knives, some of which were homemade, and over 20 different masks. The victim's decomposing body was stumbled upon by children playing in the wooded area, while Pate was already in jail for a disorderly conduct charge, having been arrested two weeks earlier. During his arrest, Pate's mugshot revealed his split tongue and a 974 tattoo on the side of his neck, associated with the white power gang known as the Gangster Disciples. He has also since expressed his intention to kill someone else in the same spot where James was murdered. At his sentencing hearing, the victim's brothers described the killer as the devil and expressed their desire for Pate to waste away in prison. Additionally, the prosecutors strongly advocated for a life sentence. Considering Pate's clear lack of remorse, Judge Dan Hall delivered the sentence, condemning Pate's actions as senseless and remorseless, and gave him life in prison with no possibility of parole. Throughout the legal proceedings, Pate refused to talk to the victim's family and never offered them a single form of an apology, illustrating the depth of his deep-rooted hatred. 9. Tamel Esco in March 2022, a hate crime consisting of attempted murder shocked the city of Yonkers, New York, when a 42-year-old black man, Tamel Esco, brutally attacked a 67-year-old Asian woman who lived in the same building as him. The horrifying crime was caught on video, showing Esco repeatedly punching the poor victim over 125 times, accompanied by one racial slur after another. Esco's extensive criminal record included 14 previous arrests, seven of which were felonies, and he was also taken into custody three separate times for violent crimes. The victim experienced severe injuries, including cuts to her head and face, facial bone fractures, and brain bleeding. But she was reported to be in stable condition at a local hospital not long after the attack. Neighbors described her as a kind and decent person, the building's tenant association expressed concerns about the safety of the residents after the incident. They cited the growing presence of individuals with violent criminal backgrounds or mental health issues living inside the complex as the root cause of the problem. The attack, which mirrored a similar one that happened in Chinatown, highlights the surge in hate crimes against Asian Americans across the country. New York City has witnessed a 96% increase in hate crimes overall with Asian hate crimes skyrocketing 343% in 2021. The Yonkers mayor and New York governor, Kathy Hochul, publicly condemned the attack, emphasizing the need to punish the offender to the fullest extent of the law. But the incident has also raised questions about the safety of vulnerable populations, particularly the homeless, who've recently become targets of a suspected serial killer in New York and Washington, D.C. City officials have advised homeless individuals to seek shelter and to collaborate with law enforcement to apprehend the suspect. But sadly, the plight of the homeless and the challenges they face in finding shelter is still a pressing concern with no end in sight. 8. Anna Montgomery In 2020, authorities in Belfast, Ireland investigated an alleged hate crime that happened in the city center. It involved an assault on a transgender woman named Anna Montgomery. Anna, who was just 20 years old at the time of the attack, was out minding her own business and enjoying a meal with her boyfriend, Jamie Gervin, when the incident took place. She said that she was suddenly hit in the face while having drinks, resulting in injuries like bruising and a deep sense of public humiliation. After attending Bangor Academy and transitioning to female at 16, 
Anna had strong support from her family, friends, and community. She'd been actively open about her personal journey, seeking to educate others about gender reassignment surgery and the transgender community as a whole. According to Belfast Live, after the attack, Anna thanked her friends as well as the restaurant staff for their unending support during the challenging time. The Police Service of Northern Ireland, PSNI, confirmed their ongoing investigation into the matter, treating it as a serious hate crime. And Anna said that even in 2020, in today's society, she faced violence for just being her true self. She says that she hopes for greater understanding and acceptance in the world moving forward. Unfortunately though, it's now 2023, and there's been no updates on the case, meaning the person responsible for the crime has likely gotten away. 7. Patrick Crucius At the beginning of July 2023, Patrick Crucius, the suspect of a racist mass shooting carried out at a Walmart in El Paso, Texas back in 2019, was handed a sentence of 90 consecutive life terms in prison. The attack targeted mainly Hispanic shoppers and tragically caused the deaths of 23 people. The sentencing hearing was presided over by U.S. District Judge David Guadarrama. Crucius pleaded guilty in February and agreed to a plea deal in order to avoid a death sentence. But he still faces Texas state charges that could potentially lead him to getting a lethal injection. During the emotional impact statements delivered by several victims in court, the devastating consequences of Crucius's actions were clear as day. Families who lost loved ones express their grief and the lasting effects the attacks has continued to have on their lives. Prosecutors also revealed that Crucius drove over 700 miles, 1,126.5 kilometers from suburban Dallas to El Paso, armed with a Romanian derivative of the infamous AK-47 and hollow point ammunition. He did this to conduct the attack on August 3rd, 2019. The motivation behind the crime was linked to Crucius's belief in a conspiracy theory he called ethnic replacement. He truly believed that immigrants from Mexico and Latin America were carrying out a Hispanic invasion of Texas. Similar ideas are common among white supremacists and have been associated with many other mass shootings. It's concerning that some see immigrants as invaders. This idea has also gained traction among some Republican lawmakers, with criticism that rhetoric like this perpetuates racist ideals. The sentencing hearing saw victims confronting Crucius directly with all of their pain and anger, with most expressing their sincere desire for justice. While Crucius's plea deal took a federal death penalty off the table, he may still face lethal injection in a Texas state court. His defense lawyer argued that he suffers from delusional thinking and a broken brain. But a trial date for the Texas state charges have yet to be set. 6. Chen Chi Shi. In September 2022, Chen Zichi was given a 24-year prison sentence for leading a vicious attack against four women at a restaurant in Tangshan, China. The assault took place in June of that year and was triggered when one of the women rejected Chen's romantic advances. Afterward, disturbing surveillance camera footage of the attack went viral, sparking widespread debates over gender violence in the country. During the fight, Chen and a group of 27 other men used bottles, chairs, and fists to brutally beat up the women that they chose as their victims. The victims suffered severe injuries, with two of them needing intensive care to recover. And although the police initially classified the extent of their wounds simply as minor, disturbing photos revealed the women were covered in blood after leaving the scene. In addition to the lengthy prison sentence, Chen was fined 320,000 yuan, 40,000 pounds, or 45,000 US dollars for what happened. The other defendants involved in the crime also received sentences ranging from a measly six months to 11 years behind bars. Additionally, the court ordered Chen and five more men to compensate the victims for medical expenses and other losses they faced. The incident shed a bit of light on the growing issue of domestic abuse in China. And in the wake of the attack, women's rights activists emphasize the need for better reporting and handling of similar cases. The brutal assault sparked outrage and intense debates on social media platforms, with discussions about gender-focused violence taking center stage on a popular platform known as Weibo. 5. Bruce MacArthur 
In 2019, a Canadian serial killer that was known for targeting gay men was sentenced to life in prison. The 67-year-old was given eight concurrent life sentences, one for each victim, and won't be eligible for parole until he serves at least 25 years. Bruce MacArthur pleaded guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder, ultimately admitting to the brutal slayings of the victims, some of whom were close personal friends of his. According to experts, Bruce MacArthur's crimes and his patterns of behavior heavily align with those of certain classes of serial killers. Crown prosecutor Michael Camplin even presented a 36-page statement in court detailing MacArthur's gruesome crimes and the graphic details surrounding the deaths. The killer has since pleaded guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder, and his victims have been publicly identified as Andrew Kinsman, Salim Eason, Skandaraj Navaratnam, Abdul Basir Faizi, Kirushna Kumar Kanagaratnam, Dean Lisowick, Sarush Mahmoodi, and Majid Kayan. Ju Young Lee, a University of Toronto associate professor of sociology who specializes in serial killers, compared MacArthur's murders to those committed by Dennis Rader, or the BTK killer, who took 10 people's lives in Wichita, Kansas. Both killers strangled their victims to death before posing their bodies in grotesque positions and taking photographs as mementos to relive the crimes over and over again. MacArthur's actions involved meticulous planning and deliberate execution, leading experts to label them as organized killings. Unlike disorganized killers, MacArthur carefully thought out each and every aspect of his murders, disposing of bodies and concealing evidence. His files on his targets were also similar to Raiders, indicating a project-like approach to the senseless crimes. The posing of victims, a behavior seen in MacArthur's case, is rare and associated with killers who derive pleasure from taking lives. The poses reflect the killer's deep-rooted desires to dominate and control people, even in death. MacArthur's photos captured victims in multiple situations, including physical assault, showcasing his desire for power over them. Serial killers typically take mementos from their victims of crime scenes as symbols of the excitement and gratification they felt during the act. These objects can evoke memories, providing satisfaction until their next urge to kill comes. MacArthur held on to his victims' bracelets and personal journals to remember just how powerful he must have been in those moments to have taken people's lives. Justice John McMahon described the murders as pure evil in court, specifically condemning MacArthur's exploitation of his target's vulnerabilities. Some of the men were homeless and struggled with addiction, while others were facing deportation or hadn't shared their real sexuality to their families. Despite MacArthur's belief that his victims would go largely unnoticed, their absence was felt deeply by their loved ones. Family members expressed their grief and anger in front of the jury, highlighting the devastating impact of the crimes. Justice McMahon commended both the prosecution and defense for the roles they played in the trial, acknowledging the challenging task of defending a clear-cut serial killer. He also praised the police investigation that ultimately brought MacArthur to justice. It's believed that MacArthur's personal battle with homosexuality haunted him, and that he likely suffered from some type of trauma as a young child. But this is just one of the reasons that have been suggested as a possible motive for his senseless murders. It's not clear why he committed such evil acts on innocent people. We'll probably never fully understand what goes on inside the head of a serial killer. 4. Brendan Doolin Brendan Doolin, a 41-year-old man from Crumlin, Dublin, who was previously sentenced to three years in prison for harassing six journalists, made an appearance before the Dublin Circuit Criminal Court in May 2023 for charges of breaching his bail conditions. In 2019, Doolin was sentenced to five years in prison. The final three years were suspended after he admitted to harassing six women by sending them hundreds of abusive messages between May 2012 and February 2018. After being released from custody in December 2021, Doolin allegedly breached his bail by making contact with his victims. Despite the law forbidding him, in April and May 2019, two of his victims, Kate McEvoy and Sarah Griffin, reported posts made online that resembled Doolin's past abusive language. 
The state police force of the Irish Republic, or the Gardaí, got a warrant to search Doolin's house, where they took his laptop. The device held photos of Kate McEvoy and Roe McDermott that were taken in the Dublin Circuit Criminal Court atrium and were linked to a specific smartphone. Further investigation led to the discovery of the hidden phone under Doolin's floorboards, and he eventually admitted that he owned it. Additionally, Doolin made multiple email addresses resembling the names of some affected parties and used them to post obnoxious messages online. The victims reported getting contacted by others asking about these messages, causing distress and fear among the targets. Doolin also responded to tweets from the victims using abusive language. But surprisingly, according to the victim impact statements presented in court as evidence, the affected parties expressed their wish for Doolin to get the necessary help to address his issues. Doolin's defense attorney, Keith Spencer BL, argued that his client's bail breaches were of a lesser magnitude than his original offenses. Spencer said that Doolin has since refrained from using computers completely and is cooperating with the probation service. He's even allegedly showed remorse for his actions. Judge Martin Nolan, who previously sentenced Doolin, described his harassment as the dark side of the internet, causing trauma to the targeted women. He emphasized the persistence of Doolin's harassment, despite the victims begging him to stop and characterized his behavior as very vindictive. Although Doolin's psychiatric report didn't dispute his awareness of right and wrong, the judge found his offenses serious and intimidating. The decision on Doolin's case was adjourned until the following day to allow further deliberation. But unfortunately, no updates have been posted on the case, so it's unclear what punishment Doolin was handed for breaching his bail. 3. Kelly Fulls In 2017, Dr. Kelly Fulls, a 35-year-old Louisiana veterinarian, faced charges after allegedly shooting and killing her neighbor's dog, Bruiser, because of incessant barking. The incident resulted in aggravated animal cruelty charges illegal discharge of a firearm, and two counts of drug possession against Fols. Bruiser was a 15-month-old American bulldog, basically a puppy, and his owner, Stacy Fitzner, found the lifeless body of her beloved pet in the backyard after leaving him while she went to work. After inspection, they found a gunshot wound to the back of the dog's head, indicating that someone had shot him. Sadly, despite efforts to save Bruiser, he succumbed to his injuries, leaving the family devastated. Fitzner condemned the act, asserting that the person responsible for the crime must be deeply disturbed to commit such cruelty. She expressed disbelief at the accusation that Bruiser could have pushed open the gates himself, pointing out that someone purposely opened them. The incident happened after Fitzner and Fulce exchanged texts about the dog's barking in the weeks leading up to the tragedy. Fitzner reportedly received hostile messages and videos from her neighbor, which escalated tensions between the two of them. Sheriff Joseph Lepinto expressed utter shock over the situation, since it involved a veterinarian shooting a neighbor's dog. Fuls was taken into custody, and it was later revealed that she used narcotics, including diazepam and Adderall. But authorities never recovered the weapon that was used in the shooting. After the crime, Dr. Fulce was fired from the veterinary hospital where she worked for over two decades, starting at the age of 15. The hospital owner expressed shock and disgust over the actions of someone with no prior history of complaints, who's considered well-liked by clients. The incident left Fitzner feeling unsafe in her own house, and the tragedy of losing Bruiser, who was a loving and friendly member of their family continues to affect them deeply to this day. Dr. Fulce remained in custody on bond, and she faced multiple charges related to the shooting and drug possession. But in the end, the judge deferred imposing a harsh sentence and instead ordered Fulce to serve three years probation. This decision didn't sit right with Fitzner and other animal lovers who view dogs as members of their family. But there just wasn't enough evidence to prove Fulce was responsible for the crime. 2. Daniel Perry In May 2023, a United States Army sergeant named Daniel Perry received 25 years in prison from a Texas State District Court for the murder of Garrett Foster, an active Black Lives Matter protester. The sentence was handed down by Judge Cliff Brown of the 147th Criminal District Court. 
Perry's legal team announced their intention to appeal the sentence in the future. And that set the stage for Republican Governor Greg Abbott to potentially pardon the Army sergeant, who claims that he acted out of self-defense. Perry was ultimately convicted of murder for the shooting of Garrett Foster, a 28-year-old U.S. Air Force veteran who participated in a Black Lives Matter rally in Austin years ago on July 25, 2020. For better context, both Perry and Foster are white. The protest happened in the aftermath of several high-profile incidents of police violence against black Americans, including the deaths of both Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. After Perry's sentencing, Sheila Foster, the mother of the victim, expressed strong relief, saying that they were finally going to get justice for Garrett. Addressing Perry directly, she expressed hope that he'd rid himself of the hatred in his heart. Before the sentencing hearing, prosecutors introduced evidence showing that Perry had made and shared racist statements online and through text messages in the past, including a message about potentially shooting looters during the protests. Prosecutor Guillermo Gonzalez argued for a minimum sentence of 25 years for the murder, characterizing Perry as a loaded gun, ready to react violently to perceived threats at any time. But Perry's defense said that the messages, although distasteful, were protected speech taken out of context. They argued that Perry was afraid for his life, since Garrett allegedly pointed an AK-47 at him during the rally. In a statement made before the sentencing, Judge Brown assured the public that Perry was given a fair and impartial trial, addressing concerns of political bias in the case. But the situation has since drawn national attention, especially among conservatives, with Governor Abbott expressing his intention to pursue a pardon for Perry. So now, only time will tell what will become of Perry's fate. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Janaya Williams As of August 2022, a Queens District Attorney named Melinda Katz has reported the arrest and charging of a third black woman in connection to a hate crime assault on a white woman in New York. 19-year-old Janiah Williams is currently facing charges of assault as a hate crime and other offenses. And if convicted, she could face anywhere from three and a half to 15 years in prison. The incident happened on July 9th, 2022, on a southbound MTA bus in Queens. Williams and two other black teenage girls allegedly approached the victim, with Williams making anti-white statements, expressing hatred towards white people as a whole. She's accused of threatening to kill the victim and repeatedly hitting her with a shopping bag holding a glass jar. And according to witness accounts, the trio also spat on the victim before leaving the bus. The unnamed victim received multiple injuries and was taken to the hospital for treatment. Once she arrived, she was given three staples on the right side of her head for a deep laceration. According to data from the NYPD's Hate Crimes Task Force, this incident is part of a growing trend as hate crimes in New York have shown a 76% increase since April 2022 compared to the previous year. The data reveals that as of June 28, 2022, there have been 35 hate crimes against black people, 51 against Asians, 149 against Jewish people, and only one against a white person. But nonetheless, authorities are committed to holding those responsible for bias-motivated attacks accountable, as they should. 18. Luke Carroll and Anthony Prince Australian best friends Luke Carroll and Anthony Prince forever branded themselves the Dumb and Dumber bank robbers in 2005 when they committed a heist in Vail, Colorado. But the robbery was fraught with mistakes that even the newest of thieves wouldn't make. The pair forgot to remove their work name tags and took no effort to disguise their Australian accents as they brandished BB guns. They then demanded cash from the teller, who recognized them as customers based on their accents. But despite these mistakes, the duo made off with around $130,000 in cash. It took police less than a day to identify the suspects, who they'd recently spoken with in connection with a credit card fraud investigation. By then, Carol and Prince had already bought a Rolex, given a $20,000 tip to a taxi driver, and used the money in other ways that further pointed toward their guilt. Authorities arrested them at a Denver International Airport, where they were attempting to board a flight to Mexico. 
and just minutes earlier, the men had posted photos of themselves holding the ill-gotten cash from the robbery on social media. They'd also tried mailing a portion of the money to Australia, and some of it was found in airport garbage cans. Carol and Prince may not have been aware of what lay in store for them with the American justice system, which is considerably harsher than Australia's. But the pair's loved ones back home seemed to have an idea. Almost immediately after the arrests, Prince's parents wrote a letter to the Vale Daily apologizing to the community for their son's behavior. They insisted that they raised Prince in a home with respectable values and that his actions were completely out of character. Family members begged for leniency in court after Carol and Prince were convicted of robbery. Both young men apologized profusely to the victims, their families, and their country for the pain and embarrassment their actions caused. And while they weren't spared from prison time like they'd hoped, the judge still went easy on them. Carol was sentenced to five years in prison, and Prince received a four-and-a-half-year term, far less than the 25-year maximum they each faced. They were also ordered to pay more than $21,000 in restitution. Carol avoided publicity after serving his time and returned to Australia, while Prince wrote a memoir about surviving life in a U.S. prison. 17. Anthony Michael Corrado A professional housekeeper in Collier County, Florida, realized that she wasn't dealing with a routine call for service when she arrived at a customer's home one afternoon in May 2023. She was greeted by a man covered in blood, and while most people would have hightailed it off the property right then and there, the housekeeper followed her client inside. She realized the urgent need to leave, though, after being led to a room containing the tarp-covered body of an elderly woman who'd clearly met a violent end. According to a probable cause statement, the man pulled back the tarp to reveal the victim's body. There was a bag over the victim's head, and when the housekeeper tried to remove the bag, the man told her to stop because she'd get blood everywhere. He asked his hired helper if she'd help him dispose of the body, and when she encouraged him to call 911, he said he couldn't because he'd go back to prison. The cleaning lady told the young man who'd hired her that she had to run out for some supplies, but instead she flagged down the first deputy she saw. Officers quickly arrived on scene and found the murdered victim, along with an elderly man who'd been beaten severely and was suffering from serious injuries. The man had returned home from grocery shopping after the housekeeper left, and according to authorities, responding deputies also found a bloody hammer at the house and observed blood on the walls and floors. The suspect was identified as 34-year-old Anthony Michael Corrado, and the victims were identified as his grandparents, Mary and Tony Schiavone. Records revealed that Mary had an order of protection against Corrado, who'd been released from prison the previous year. After being found alive, Tony Schiavone was airlifted to a trauma center. Neighbors who spoke with Wink News said that nothing unusual had ever been observed at the home prior to the gruesome murder and assault. They were shocked that something so horrific had happened so close to where they live. Corrado refused to speak with authorities and was booked into custody on charges of second-degree murder and aggravated battery of a person over 65. But his motive for the alleged crime is unclear. 16. MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson On January 6, 1995, two men entered a bank in Swissvale, Pennsylvania. One of them got in line while the other robbed a teller at gunpoint. They then made off with around $6,000 and proceeded to rob another bank in the same fashion. Neither of the culprits wore masks or disguises during the robberies, nor did they try to shield their faces from the bank's security cameras. The suspect who stood in line, Clifton Earl Johnson, was arrested a few days after the crimes. His co-conspirator, MacArthur Wheeler, was captured a few months later after police released surveillance images and asked the public for help identifying him. When interrogators showed Wheeler pictures of himself at the crime scenes, he was shocked. He said, but I wore the lemon juice. I wore the lemon juice. Detectives had absolutely no clue what he meant by this, but they soon learned that Wheeler and Johnson had rubbed lemon juice on their faces prior to the crimes, thinking it would make them invisible on camera. Their lack of disguises suddenly made a lot more sense to detectives, but at the same time, it was hard to understand how the men actually believed that lemon juice would make them absent from security footage. 
Wheeler said that Johnson gave him the idea. He said he was skeptical at first, but when he tried the method himself by slathering his face with lemon juice and taking a Polaroid, to his surprise, his face was absent from the photo. But of course, detectives came to the more rational conclusion that the camera had malfunctioned, or Wheeler had unknowingly snapped the photo at an angle that kept him out of the frame. Clifton Earl Johnston pleaded guilty to one of the robberies he committed with Wheeler and two others from unrelated cases. He testified against his accomplice and received a five-year prison sentence as a result. MacArthur Wheeler was sentenced to 24 and a half years in prison, followed by three years of supervised release. After reading about the case, Cornell University social psychology professor David Dunning began to wonder, in his own words, if Wheeler was too stupid to be a bank robber. Perhaps he was also too stupid to know that he was too stupid to be a bank robber. That is, his stupidity protected him from an awareness of his own stupidity. Dunning and graduate student Justin Kruger worked together to study whether someone's perceived competence could make them ignorant of their actual abilities or lack thereof. The researchers concluded that it's certainly possible and classified it as a cognitive bias that's now famously known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. They concluded that when a person is incompetent in their chosen strategies for achieving success and satisfaction, they come to inaccurate conclusions and make poor choices without realizing it. In other words, they're totally unaware of their own self-sabotage, and they think they're doing just fine. 15. Botched Alaska Bank Robberies During the late afternoon hours one day in 2018, a man entered a bank in Anchorage, Alaska and handed the teller a note stating, this is a holdup. Please put the money they want in the bag. God help us. The teller then gave the thief $400 and he left. But the robber had written the demand note on the back of a subsidized housing application bearing his name and address. Needless to say, it didn't take police long to identify the suspect as Michael Gale Nash. They also didn't have to search very hard to track him down. Responding officers arrived at the scene a few minutes after the robbery to find Nash standing outside the bank, counting the stolen money. FBI spokeswoman Stern Chief Vega Balassier described it as being one of the quickest apprehensions in recent local history. According to a criminal complaint, Nash admitted to the robbery during questioning, and as a result he was federally charged for his alleged crimes. Nash's arrest came on the heels of another headline-making robbery at an Alaska bank. Just weeks earlier, in April 2018, 28-year-old Derek Moore and a male accomplice entered a Wells Fargo branch in Anchorage and held it up at gunpoint, and apparently they left with over $15,000 in cash. According to a federal complaint, the men ran across a parking lot, down a nature trail, and into a cul-de-sac, where Moore's girlfriend, 31-year-old Bethany McKeel, was waiting for them in a getaway car. Little did they know, an informant was on the case and would soon turn over detrimental voice recordings to the FBI. In a tape-recorded conversation with McKeel and Moore, the couple allegedly bragged about how easy it was to carry out the robbery. And according to a transcript, Moore could be heard saying, It's real easy, you just give the note to the teller. Once I put the bag in their face and told them to give me all of it, it was a wrap. Moore also allegedly raised the possibility of robbing another bank in the near future. But he didn't get the chance, because the informant ratted him and McKeel out, and they were soon arrested for their alleged crimes. 14. Craig Abel Criminal suspects have different ways of being uncooperative with law enforcement. 46-year-old Craig Abel's method involved acting as childish as possible in front of the camera in his booking cell at the West Penn Police Department in Wisconsin. Abel was accused of committing a hit and run after investigators concluded that some damage to a family's garage matched his truck. This was his sixth operating while intoxicated charge. And after spotting the camera in his cell, he began dancing, making strange facial expressions, lifting his shirt and slapping his midsection, and rolling around on the floor while verbally taunting the police. He also mooned the camera, slapped his behind, and farted. But that's not all, folks. He continued his childish display by slapping and hitting the walls, and performed what seemed like a middle-aged man's best attempt at twerking. 
The staff members watching on the other end eventually decided that they had had enough of the strange strip-teasing tantrum. An officer entered the cell and ordered Abel to put his hands behind his back. But instead of complying, he questioned why he needed to be handcuffed when he was already locked in a room. The officer plainly replied, you're pounding on the walls and exposing yourself. This apparently wasn't a good enough explanation for Abel though, who continued to refuse to follow orders. Two more officers then entered the room and removed him, bringing his bizarre one-man variety show to an end. And in the end, Abel pleaded guilty to the operating while intoxicated charge and was sentenced to four years behind bars. 13. Lance Kurtz If there's someone on this planet who should have exercised their right to remain silent, it's 21-year-old Lance Kurtz. He first caught law enforcement's attention one night in early 2023 when someone reported seeing his car on fire along a roadside in Flagler County, Florida. By the time a deputy stopped by to check out the stranded motorist, the fire was out, but he quickly noticed that Kurtz had no tags on his vehicle. Kurtz said that he'd just bought the car and planned to take care of the tags later that week. Then, without being asked, he confessed to having an unregistered gun in the car. The deputy let him off with a verbal warning, but wouldn't allow him to drive his vehicle. When asked what his plan was, Kurt said he'd call a friend to pick him up. The friend was coming from at least an hour away, so he had a long wait ahead of him. But he wanted to feed his dog, who was in the car. So after directing him to a nearby gas station and telling him to hurry because it was about to close, the deputy left the scene. A few hours later, law enforcement received a call about a break-in at the very same convenience store. By then, the intruder was gone, but they left behind a key piece of identifying information on the counter, their debit card, and it belonged to none other than Lance Kurtz. The deputy who'd spoken with the young man earlier in the evening returned to the roadside where his car was parked. Lance was there, and he quickly admitted to breaking into the business by maneuvering the door open with a knife. He said that the store was closing when he arrived and the clerk refused to serve him, but that he needed dog food. The eccentric suspect claimed that he left his debit card behind on purpose so he could return during business hours and pay for the items he stole. He also offered to show police the knife he used to break into the store. It would have been a good idea for Lance to stop talking at that point, but he continued to overshare. Once again, without being asked, he admitted to having some LSD tablets in his possession. But the cops looked everywhere and couldn't find the drugs. At the same time, Lance's behavior was becoming increasingly strange. After putting two and two together, the deputies and the suspect realized that he'd swallowed his entire stash. Lance was booked into custody on suspicion of armed burglary of a dwelling slash structure and petty theft. While his current legal situation is unclear, it appears as though he was released from custody after posting a $10,000 bond and landing back behind bars for a few weeks. A well-meaning friend created a crowdfunding campaign in an effort to raise money for a better defense lawyer for Lance. On the website, they wrote that the young man's behavior had changed noticeably leading up to his arrest and that Lance was experiencing an especially rough period amid lifelong emotional distress. The campaign is still active, but has only raised $355 of its $10,000 goal, suggesting that not everyone shares these sympathetic views of the person who created the page. 12. Alicia Tierney A neighborhood dispute in Albuquerque, New Mexico devolved into an immature act of vandalism one night in 2021 when one of the parties spray-painted the other's house. The victim heard movement outside and thought someone was at her door, but when her son looked through the peephole, all he could see was red. She exited the house to find the word white trash scrawled across her garage in red paint along with a statement below it that was too sloppily written to be understood. There was also paint on the front door and two of the family's vehicles. Witnesses quickly directed police to the home of a neighbor named Alicia Tierney. While the victims said they didn't know the woman, others told police that Tierney had recently been trying to collect dues from households for a homeowners association that didn't exist. They speculated that the suspect's alleged act of vandalism might have had something to do with her anger over people refusing to pay the non-existent HOA dues. Neighbors also said that Tierney had complained in the past about the amount of items in front of the victim's house. 
Local station KRGE reported that Tierney was actually listed as the director and treasurer of an active HOA, but that no updates had been reported in over a year, suggesting that it was more or less defunct. Either way, vandalizing someone's house is no way to resolve a complaint about someone's residence already being an eyesore. According to police, the victim said she'd seen Tierney walking by with a can of spray paint and her hand covered in red shortly after discovering the graffiti on her house. She told officers that Tierney asked her what had happened as if she had nothing to do with the crime. When police confronted Tierney at her home, she still had paint all over her hand. She almost immediately said that she was drunk and tried telling her side of the story, which didn't make a whole lot of sense. In body cam footage of the arrest, she could also be heard admitting to the act of vandalism multiple times. Tiani was charged with two felony counts of criminal damage to property totaling more than $1,000. But thanks to her clean record and her displays of remorse, the prosecutor saw her as a good candidate for a pre-diversion program, which enabled her to avoid a conviction as long as she followed certain rules set forth by the court. In Tierney's case, this involved regular drug tests and check-ins with her case officer. She was also ordered to pay $4,400 for the damages to the victim's home. While the middle-aged vandal managed to avoid any serious legal consequences, the court of public opinion was arguably less forgiving. In 2023, body cam footage of Tierney's arrest was featured on the new ID channel crime series called Late Night Lockup. Cringe-worthy clips from the booking and processing unit showed her being uncooperative and overtly flirtatious with officers, who made it clear that they didn't want her to call them baby. Fellow arrestees were also noticeably irritated by her behavior as she rambled non-stop, as if she were at a social club rather than jail, and completely lacked an understanding of how serious the situation was. 11. Orlando Henderson to many, it seems like common sense not to post photos of oneself with large amounts of money or extravagant purchases after committing a robbery. But a lot of criminals seem to miss this page in their handbook. A 29-year-old Wells Fargo employee from Charlotte, North Carolina named Orlando Henderson fell into the latter category in 2019 when he flaunted stacks of cash and an extravagant lifestyle that he was accused of funding with money stolen from his workplace. According to federal authorities, Henderson stole cash from deposits made by customers on at least 18 separate occasions and falsified records to conceal the thefts. He allegedly took upwards of $88,000 total. The release announcing his arrest stated that on the same days he was suspected of stealing money from the bank's vault, Henderson made cash deposits at an ATM near his employer. He was also accused of destroying documents and making false entries or having his co-workers make false entries in the bank's books. Henderson allegedly used some of the stolen cash as a down payment on a Mercedes-Benz and obtained a loan for the balance using fake documents. He was charged with transactional laundering, two counts of financial institution fraud, 19 counts of theft, embezzlement and misapplication, as well as 12 counts of making false entries. Most of these charges can come with hefty prison sentences and fines. And in Henderson's case, he was looking at the possibility of up to 30 years and a $1 million penalty each for several counts that he faced. He pleaded guilty to two counts of financial institution fraud and one count of transactional laundering and was sentenced to one year in federal prison followed by two years of supervised release. The court also ordered Henderson to pay back all the money he stole. 10. Douglas Peter Kelly Cops love it when someone makes their job easier, and they love it even more when a dim-witted criminal unwittingly hands themselves into custody. In June of 2018, a Florida man named Douglas Peter Kelly allegedly called the Putnam County Sheriff's Office and shared his suspicions that he'd been dealt a bad batch of methamphetamine. He said he had a violent reaction to the drug, which meth is known to do but apparently it was unusual for the drunk to have that effect on Kelly. According to authorities, the concerned user said he wanted to press charges against his dealer and have the product looked at to determine whether he was sold the wrong narcotic. Detectives said they'd be happy to help and told Kelly to come on by the station. It's unclear whether they thought he was serious or not until he actually showed up at the station and handed over a bag of crystalline powder. 
it tested positive for methamphetamine and Kelly was charged with possession as a result. In a viral Facebook post detailing the arrest, the sheriff's department wrote, Remember, our detectives are always ready to assist anyone who believes they were misled in their illegal drug purchase. Do you know anyone who's been arrested for doing something stupid? Tell us their story in the comments below. And while you're at it, subscribe to the channel. 9. Anthony Goddard Bail bond agent Nimia Cropper exited the Mecklenburg County Jail in North Carolina one day in January 2023 and discovered that her SUV had vanished from the parking lot. Surveillance footage revealed that just minutes earlier, an accused car thief named Anthony Deshaun Goddard had bonded out with help from a different agent. He was allegedly seen stealing Cropper's vehicle and driving away in the jail security video. Given the nature of her profession, Cropper had seen a lot of crazy things over the years, but this was her first experience with the level of audacity that the suspect displayed. Speaking with WSOC-TV, she described Goddard as the city's boldest and dumbest criminal. At the same time, it wasn't Goddard's first rodeo with the law over stolen vehicle allegations. Based on his record, car theft seems to be his crime of choice. It was repeat offenders like him that made Cropper wish that authorities would crack down harder on crime. Goddard's alleged actions made her feel especially concerned for people who lacked comprehensive insurance coverage for their cars. In other words, their policy wouldn't cover their total losses if their vehicle were to be stolen or destroyed. The infuriated bond agent told WSOC that she'd already used her connections within the bail bond community to ensure that Goddard was blacklisted and that he'd have an extremely hard time finding someone willing to bond him out the next time he lands behind bars. In fact, she said she couldn't wait for it to happen. Unfortunately, though, when the story broke, Goddard was still at large and Cropper's SUV was still missing. According to jail records, it appears as though the suspected car thief hasn't been captured yet. 8. Sean Brown A Boost mobile employee in Philadelphia didn't have much to offer to a thief who entered the store one evening in 2019 and demanded cash at gunpoint. The worker explained that the store didn't keep much money on hand, but he told the robber that he could retrieve more cash from a co-worker who was outside the store. This wasn't true, but the suspect later identified as 20-year-old Sean Brown bought the explanation and allowed the employee to leave. But on his way out, the worker locked the thief inside the business. After realizing that he'd been outsmarted, Brown began shooting at the doors and windows in an attempt to break out of the store. When this didn't work, though, he allegedly ran into the basement and began banging on the door of an adjacent business. Diana Sullivan, who worked next door, later told NBC Philadelphia that Brown was unable to get into the store because it has really strong locks. She said he even tried shooting the lock out, but it didn't budge. A brief standoff ensued while Brown remained barricaded inside the store, and just 45 minutes later, he was taken into custody. Brown was also identified as the suspect in the robbery of another cell phone store less than an hour before he robbed Boost Mobile. According to police, he entered a Metro PCS store with his face half-covered and robbed the register at gunpoint. He also stole an iPhone 7, even though newer and more expensive models were on display. Store employee Diodara Colon held back very little while telling ABC about the disorganized nature of the crime. She described the suspect as calm and dumb, and said that she and her co-workers didn't really know what he was doing. Colon also said that Brown made small talk and flirted while carrying out the sloppy robbery. Like most cell phone stores, the business didn't have a large amount of cash on hand, so he didn't make off with very much. Brown was charged with 18 counts between the two alleged thefts, including robbery, recklessly endangering another person, theft by receiving stolen property, aggravated assault, terroristic threats, and more. 7. Nicholas F. Brannan some might say that luck was on Nicholas F. Brannan's side when he managed to avoid jail time after deliberately crashing his car into a city hall building in Cumberland, Wisconsin in 2021. Security footage showed the sedan smashing through the glass doors during the evening hours. And a few moments later, Brannan exited the vehicle and sat down next to it. He seemed oddly calm for someone who just rammed a car through the entrance of a building. 
The local police station is located inside City Hall, so it wasn't long before an officer arrived at the scene. By then, Brannon had his hands in the air as if to show that he was willing to cooperate and be taken into custody peacefully. But the officer had some questions first, including why the disgruntled driver committed the destructive act in the first place. Brennan said that his son had recently been arrested on a drug charge that he believed was more serious than the incident warranted. He felt as though the Cumberland police were conspiring against his son and said the situation had been stressing him out. In addition to confessing that he was drunk, Brannon admitted that he crashed into the building on purpose. He said he wanted to send a message to the people he thought were being unfair toward his son. And when subjected to a BAC test, his blood alcohol content was more than twice the legal limit for driving. All things considered, it's pretty surprising that he didn't get locked up for the crime. But he did get stuck with a nearly $32,000 debt for the damages he caused to City Hall and a requirement to pay it in monthly installments of at least $100. Brannon was also ordered to serve either 10 days in jail or perform 80 hours of community service, and he was banned from City Hall without a police escort. 6. Claude Vincent Griffin In what appears to be an impromptu burglary at a cell phone store in Florida during the early morning hours in June 2023, the suspect in question robbed the business wearing a cardboard box over his head as a disguise. A security camera captured footage of the man entering the store in Miami Gardens at around 4 a.m. and smashing a display case as he ransacked the inventory. He made off with 19 iPhones and more than $8,000 in cash, according to store owner Jeremiah Baganza, who told NBC6 that he noticed the suspect briefly lifting the box he was wearing on his head to get a better look at something he was stealing. Berganza managed to pause the video at just the right moment and caught a still shot of the man's face. The store owner then sent to work warning nearby businesses about the thief and looking for the suspect himself. Police eventually found the alleged burglar drinking booze at a nearby liquor store. 33-year-old Claude Vincent Griffin was charged with grand theft, burglary, criminal mischief, cocaine possession, and resisting an officer without violence. In the meantime, social media users had a field day commenting on his unusual disguise. 5. Casey Kazee Better known as the duct tape bandit, a Kentucky man named Casey Kazee attempted to rob a liquor store in 2007 with his face wrapped in duct tape and a t-shirt pulled up over his head. He claimed he had a gun and threatened to kill the clerk, hoping the employee would fork over the cash he was demanding. But things didn't go as planned. The store's manager chased the suspect outside with a club, and employees held him down until police arrived. Kazee's makeshift disguise quickly earned him a top-ranking spot among the dumbest criminals in history as the story went viral. He made the situation even worse for himself when he threw up gang signs and proclaimed his innocence during a jailhouse interview. The wannabe bandit ultimately pleaded guilty to second-degree robbery and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He was paroled in 2014, but soon landed himself back behind bars for assaulting a businessman named Marcus Woodward. According to authorities, Kazee and an accomplice approached the victim in an alleyway, shoved him to the ground, and stole his jewelry and some other items. Kazee was convicted of first-degree robbery and sentenced to 12 years in prison, which he's currently serving. When he finishes serving his current term, He'll have to serve another two and a half years to finish out his duct tape robbery sentence since he violated his parole. 4. James Blankenship 32-year-old James Blankenship's mother banned him from her home when they had some issues getting along in 2013. But three months later, he decided to break into his mom's house in Ohio in broad daylight. He removed a screen and crawled in through a window, but his mother quickly discovered his presence and he fled the scene on foot. Blankenship's mum called the police, and a neighbor told responding officers which direction they'd seen the suspect running in. The cops found Blankenship hiding in a crawl space near his mother's home. He was surprised to learn that he was being arrested for burglary, because he thought a person could only get arrested for burglary at night time. It's unclear where he got this idea, but the police were quick to correct Blankenship's misconception and let him know that breaking into someone's home is illegal at all times. 
The unsavvy criminal pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of breaking and entering and was sentenced to six months in jail with 120 days suspended, which meant that he'd be locked up for three months. And as an additional punishment, he was fined $100. 3. Umar Mirza When he failed to land a job at a gambling parlor in Birmingham, England in 2017, 26-year-old Umar Mirza entered the business one morning and demanded money at gunpoint. He was wearing a mask throughout the robbery, but removed it as he exited the store with over $21,000 in cash that he'd just stolen. Employees caught a close enough glimpse of the suspect to recognize him as a recent job applicant, and it just so happened that the parlor still had Mirza's resume on file. During a visit to his home, police reportedly found a note written on a betting slip, stating, I've got a gun, open the door or I will shoot you. It appeared to be the same note that had been used in the robbery. Officers also discovered a fake gun and the bag that the robbery suspect was seen using during the crime. According to law enforcement, Mirza had also been present during the recent robbery of another gambling parlor, where a fellow suspect was accused of using the same fake gun to hold the place up. A quick-thinking manager activated an alarm, causing the place to fill with smoke, and luckily the police called the suspects after they left empty-handed. The young man's lawyer told the court that his client had a severe gambling addiction which drove him to commit the robberies. Mirza had been hooked on internet betting for at least three years when he found himself in a desperate position. As a forklift driver, by day, he couldn't afford to pay off his mounting gambling debts, which totaled more than $30,000. But after pleading guilty to robbery and being sentenced to six years in prison, Mirza would have to worry about his financial problems at a later date and time. 2. David and Ezra Guerra Investigators with the Bexar County Sheriff's Office in Texas didn't wait long to act after receiving a tip in 2022 about a 17-year-old named David Guerra. He'd apparently posted photos of himself with THC cartridges, weapons, and cash on social media. And in the pictures, he could be seen wearing what looked like expensive bling. An investigation was launched, and when they got the chance, deputies pulled Guerra's vehicle over. Inside the car, they found hash oil, a loaded handgun, and cash. During a subsequent search of Guerra's home, authorities reportedly found three guns, cocaine, more hash oil, marijuana, and $15,000 in cash. David Guerra was charged with possession of a controlled substance, reckless conduct, traffic, and unlawfully carrying a weapon. A second suspect, 21-year-old Ezra Guerra, was charged with possession of a controlled substance with intent to deliver and possession of marijuana. Unfortunately, though, the current status of the case is unclear. 1. Corey T. Phillips At around 10 p.m. on a Monday night in 2019, a man wearing a knit cap and a t-shirt over his face entered a hotel in Paddock, Kentucky and demanded money at gunpoint. When the clerk handed over the cash, the robber set his gun on the front desk because he needed two hands to put the money in his bag. The employee grabbed the gun and pointed it at the suspect, who then fled the scene. Investigators discovered that the gun had recently been reported stolen in a home burglary. A few days later, police pulled over a gray sedan for a routine traffic stop and noticed that the driver, 26-year-old Corey T. Phillips, was acting nervous. Inside the car, they found a laptop that had been reported stolen in the same burglary that the gun was taken. After putting two and two together with the computer and the firearm, detectives found other evidence connecting Phillips to the robbery. Phillips was charged with first-degree robbery and receiving a stolen firearm. And according to records, he's currently serving prison time for both counts, along with multiple other charges. He's expected to be released in 2033. Have you ever had to deal with a hater? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.